So today in the studio we have Dr. R. Chidambaram. He is the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. And earlier he was in BRC, he was director of BRC and then he was also involved in the nuclear technology program. So Dr. Chidambaram, uh, well I think you have contributed much to the atomic energy program. But to our young students, I'd like to tell, uh, ex explore some of your personal journey uh, towards, you know, becoming a principal scientific advisor to the government of India. So I'd like to start with your s young days, school days. Where did you do your schooling? See, I was uh, up to the seventh standard. I studied in Meerut. Meerut. And uh, oh, you are South Indian, but you. My father was in service in Meerut. In Meerut. Okay. And uh, actually, uh, Hindi was the medium of instruction for oh, my first seven, uh, uh -huh. uh, seven classes. Okay. And uh, then we moved to Chennai. Okay. Then I went to the high, high school and then college. Then did my honors in uh, Presidency College, Madras. Presidency College, Madras. Madras. Uh, but that means you must be multilingual, you know Hindi, you know Tamil, you know yeah. English and so many languages. <laughs> uh, did this transfer from uh, Hindi belt to Tamil belt, did it, you know, sort of have uh, any problems? Not really, because at home we used to speak Tamil. Okay. And uh, here it uh, became, when I joined uh, the high school uh -huh. in, in uh, Chennai, okay. then we went to English uh, medium of instruction. Oh, so there was a change in medium of instruction from, from Hindi, Hindi to English. English. Did it not have really. any problems? No. Not really. Not really. But normally all the, you know, vernacular <coughs> class medium school students, you know, they find it difficult. No, so but we were uh, taught uh, good English in that uh, middle oh. school. So what was it? Yep. Uh, when, when was it? That was, you know, I finished uh, seventh standard in 1947. 1947, so, so pre-independence. Pre-independence. And, and, and uh, it actually we moved to Chennai just before independence. Just before independence. So do you remember any teachers, any teacher, school teacher who had influence on your... <coughs> See actually this school was started by my father oh. and a person called Pratay Singh Patak. Pratay Singh Patak. Who was the principal, he became the principal. Uh -huh. And about 10 years back when I was uh, driving to Roorkee, I said, uh, let me go and have a, a look at my old school. Okay. And not no, nothing great about it, though the junior college was very good. Uh -huh. And then it was a Sunday. Okay. So I told the watchman that uh, uh, when I was a student here, uh, my principal was uh, Mr. Fateh Singh Patak. He says he lives in that house. Oh, he's not. Are you, are you sure? He said, yes, he lives in that house. Uh -huh. So I bought a lot of uh, fruits and uh -huh. sweets and went to their house. Uh -huh. Still a proud man, 90 plus. Okay. And uh, he was uh, walking straight. Uh -huh. Then went and sat down and told me, Mama, you are a child. You are a child. Okay. And then Pratay Singh Patak ji told me, You are a child in Mumbai. You are a child in Mumbai. You are a child in Mumbai. You are a child Very interestingly. Because he was a friend of my father, oh, he had kept father. track, he was the, though we had not corresponded, corresponded. Okay. he had kept track of uh, our family. And but do you remember any science teacher who, you know, influenced you during that uh, period? Not, no. uh, not really. No. I can't uh, uh, maybe in your college, in Presidency <coughs> College? College, Presidency College, there were uh, several, uh, several good teachers. Like we had uh, Mr. Ramamurthy who should teach us uh, heat and thermodynamics. <laughs> There was a case Krishna Murthy, mm -hmm. and there was a Sampan who used to teach us mechanics. Mm -hmm. There are a number of good teachers in Princeton College, Madras at that time. But you studied nuclear physics. Why did you take nuclear physics in your master's? Actually, you know, interestingly, I, when I joined the Indian Institute of Science, I wanted to do metallurgy. You wanted to do metallurgy? Metallurgy. But uh, Professor R.S. Krishnan, at that time I had got the first rank in the Madras University. Oh. In physics, uh -huh. physics. So Professor R. S. Krishnan, who was head of the department of physics, called me and said, you are not doing metallurgy, you are joining the physics department. <laughs> okay. That is how I joined the physics department. Uh -huh. And then what happened was, the, my initial work was on the analog computers. I started with analog oh, computers. I see. My MSA thesis 
and another computer another for computer. Uh, Fourier synthesis. Fourier synthesis. So but for PhD, I switched to nuclear magnetic well. NMR. NMR. In fact, we built a Professor Surian was the person I daily work with. Mm -hmm. Professor Surian and I uh, built uh, the first uh, wide line NMR spectrometer in India. It worked very well. These yeah. days, you know, students do not want to develop anything on, with their own hands. Whereas mm -hmm. during that pure period, there was a culture to do build your own instruments. So, do you think that today students are not gaining enough of the yes, inside you of know, the instruments? Yes, in those days, uh, the problem was uh, foreign exchange was not easily available, and, and lack of foreign exchange was a big driver for uh, for, for indigenous uh, development. But as India has progressed in currency has become stronger, foreign exchange mm -hmm. reserves have increased. Mm -hmm. Funding agencies are no longer in, uh, insisting on your building your own equipment, yeah. except in places where it cannot be built. Cannot be built. So again, uh, in neutron diffraction, you built your own equipment there. So why did you build there? Again? No, because such equipment is not available. Available. So again, okay, neutron, neutron spectrometer is not available, and we went. Uh, Progressively indigenizing it, almost yes. keeping pace with the world, mm -hmm. we had uh, what we call a mechanical kind of automation, two-dimensional automation. Yes. Then we went to printer control, printer paper tape okay. control spectrometers. Finally, we went to. By the time Electro Electrons Corporation had come out with this uh, 12-bit computer, mm -hmm. TDC 312, we used that to automate the diffractometer, and then we collected, then we shifted to Druva. So now, of course, they have uh, some of the best, uh, some of the best computer-controlled uh, diffractometers and uh, data analysis software. So, how do we make our industry to R and D? See, things are changing. In my opinion, okay. things are changing. See that, that there is. Uh, I was explaining in my lecture that in a developed country, there is a thermodynamic equilibrium okay. between the knowledge in the academic system. And the knowledge which has been transferred to or generated within the industry. The two are very close to close. each other. So industry is waiting for so new knowledge to come out of the academic system. Indian industry has so far been a couple of notches, but it's not true across the board. You have to look at each, uh, each, industry. Each, each industry. In many cases, there are a couple of notches below. If that happens, they are more than happy to have transfer of technology from an established manufacturer rather than generating new knowledge using the academic uh, academic system. But when does a country transfer technology to after taking all the benefits out of it, they will give you the technology. Nobody is going to give an Indian company technology to enable them to glo go globally compete with them. But as India becomes... Uh, globally competitive in more and more sectors, okay. then is where mm. a strong industry. interaction with the academic system yeah, will yeah. start. And, 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 and I think this will begin to happen in the next 10 years. Probably in chemical industry it is happening. Chemical in industry, in nuclear IT. it has happened, IT. space it has happened. Okay, so what is that one thing you would like to tell to young minds, you know, what, how brighter is the future for them? See, India is growing very rapidly. Right. Nobody can stop uh, stop India, but the young people can uh, accelerate, can contribute, can accelerate uh, the rate of this uh, rate of this growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, India today, more than perhaps any country in the world, mm -hmm. and all this in a democratic environment, mm -hmm. is going to provide opportunities and challenges. Which yes. I think the young people should take maximum, uh, maximum benefit. No, like uh, challenges that you had in your science <laughs> career, you solve it by designing <laughs> instrument, developing instruments. I think yeah. that is one example yeah. that they should take. But uh, still, how, uh, what they should do to you know overcome these challenges that they have, or how will they accelerate the gro growth? See, every one of us has some talent. Yes. It is the responsibility of the individual to maximize that talent. Talent, maximize And it is the responsibility of his or her talent. And it is the responsibility of the society to help him or her in in this uh, enable in the, them to in this uh, process. Process. 
second thing is, uh, you know, Einstein was once asked, Einstein, what is it that makes a great scientist? So Einstein replied, people think it is the intellect. They are wrong, it is the character. Oh. We need uh, character in character. our scientists, character in our managers, character in our politicians, Integrate everybody in India. So there will be temptation in order to deviate and you can rationalize it perhaps sometimes. But one should not do one that. Should not do that. <laughs> so integrity uh, is the most important thing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.